Welcome back to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neuronal Dynamics of Cognition. We have been looking at attractor memories, but on the way towards more biological realism, there are still a few steps to be taken. In particular, we still have the problem that neurons are binary plus minus one. So if you think of the input to neuron I, the total input, and if you take SJ as plus or minus one, then this is like you have positive pulses coming in and negative pulses coming, on, coming in to a postsynaptic neuron. And that's not very, very realistic. In fact, real neurons have binary variables. They have spikes, short pulses that are on or absent. So a better description would be binary input in the form of zeros and ones. So let us try to rewrite the equation. I just replace S by sigma. Let's propose a combination that S i is 2 sigma i minus 1. Let's check this. If I plug in sigma equal 1, I get an output of 1. If I plug in sigma equal 0, I get an output of minus 1. So this is just a rewrite which works in both directions. But let's plug this in. So I replace the sj by 2 sigma j minus 1 and I keep the rest. So I have sum over j wij 2 sigma 1 2 sigma j minus 1. I can split this up. I can say this is sum over j wij tilde sigma j minus some constant ci. What is this wij tilde? This is just 2wij. What is this neuron-specific constant ci? Well, ci is sum over j wij. Now let us suppose we have the standard Hopfield weights for patterns that have mean activity 50%. So the Wij is Pi mu, Pj mu, with an appropriate constant, say 1 over n. And for each of the weights, I have to sum over mu, and I still have to sum over j, because I consider the sum j Wij, which I can rewrite as sum over j, 1 over n, Pj mu, times pi mu sum over mu. Now, if the mean activity, if I sum over all neurons in the network, if the mean activity is exactly zero, not just expected to be zero, but exactly zero, then this constant would disappear. Otherwise, I would have to keep this constant. Now, the same argument can also be applied for low activity patterns. Ci is sum over j wij. For low activity patterns, I would take ci mu minus b, cj mu minus a, sum over mu, sum over j, with some constant in front. Same argument as before. I take the sum over j, I take the cj mu minus a, and I have a term, sum over j, cj mu minus a. The activity of these patterns is exactly equal to a, say, exactly equal to 10%, this term goes. Now, with these new variables, 0 and 1, it's much easier to interpret input as spikes. So I will have many different time steps, and in each time step, there's a value of 1, or else there's 0. So this was the first step. We went from s to binary variables sigma. Now the second step is we would like to separate excitation and inhibition. Note here that weights can be positive or negative. So if I have a cj mu equal to 1, I have a positive term here. If I have a cj mu equal to 0, I have a negative term. And this is true even if I set the constant b equal to zero. 
I would still have positive and negative weights, which is biologically not plausible because in biology, neurons that send out positive weights are called excitatory neurons. And these are different neurons than those that send out negative weights, which are called inhibitory neurons. Now, if you do a little calculation, hi of t, and I take this b equal zero, consideration c times sum over j, ci mu times cj mu minus a. And here, for simplicity, I've dropped the sum over mu times sigma j. I made already the replacement under the conditions discussed on the previous slide. You see that we can separate this. I can pull out the term with a, and then I have sum over j ci mu times a times sigma j of t with the minus sign. And I would keep the other term, sum over j, ci mu, cj mu, sigma j of t. Now here, this guy is 0, 1, this guy is 0, 1. So these weights are either 0, or 1, which means they are never negative. They're always positive or 0. Same thing here. I have a minus sign. A is a positive constant, say 10%, 0.1. Ci mu is either 0 or 1, and I have a minus sign. So this is like separate inhibition. These are neurons that just send out inhibitory spikes. However, it's still the same neuron. So we still have not succeeded to separate excitation and inhibition. However, let's just assume that we have two populations of neurons. There's excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And the excitatory neurons have weights, which are just given by this formula here, which means each term here is either 0 or 1. So overall, I have excitatory weights, I have positive weights. And the term that appeared with a negative sign is embedded here as interaction with inhibitory neurons, which in turn send information back to the excitatory neurons. So this way, the two terms we had on a previous slide are separated out into two different populations. Now there are two of these inhibitory populations. On the previous calculation, we needed one which is nearly linear or mainly linear. So this would be inhibitory 2 in our situation. And then I would have another one, inhibitory population 1, which controls the overall activity of this network so that never more than, say, 10% of the neurons can be active at the same time. So I need a very steep input-output curve, which has a sharp threshold theta. Okay, so what we have seen. We have seen that I can go from plus minus one neurons to spiking neurons. I can go to very low activity, and I can separate excitation and inhibition. And here's now an application. So we have loaded several different patterns, in total 90 patterns. Each of these patterns is low activity. So if I have 8,000 neurons total, that means each pattern involves roughly 800 neurons. And you see here just 30 neurons out of the 8,000, and you see that during this pattern, the first four neurons are active, but there are also many other neurons that are active. There are some neurons that are not active, and there are some neurons that are active at low rates. So here we give a partial input of this pattern, say of this concept, a concept could be the Apple concept, and then the input is removed. So the network is in the free recall, and you see that it thinks about the Apple, the Apple concept is re retrieved, the Apple concept is represented during all this time. At a later time, we give a different input, say it's a banana input, it's a different subset of neurons that's active. The input is short. It's only during this short time period, but the activity persists for a very long time. So the network loads a memory, and then it stays in the network in the form of a working memory. At this location here, we gave a strong input to the inhibitory neurons, and the net result is that the network folds back 
in a spontaneous state where none of the learned patterns is active. Some neurons are active, other are not, others are not active. So this network of 8,000 neurons total can store many patterns. Each neuron is involved in the, in of, in the retrieval of many of these patterns. So the concepts are distributed across different neurons, and each neuron participates in several of these concepts. And the whole thing works with spike in neurons that emit spikes occasionally from time to time. So what we see here is, yes, it's possible to have memory with spike in neurons. We can work with low activity of patterns. Yes, we can separate excitation and addition. This is a model with spike in neurons of the integrated fire type. We have asymmetric weights. We have low connection probability. All this is possible. The question now is, how does this relate to neural data? Let me come back to what we saw last week. We said that there are neurons in a certain region of the human brain, in the hippocampus or nearby, and these neurons, the same neuron, responds whether the image is that of the opera or whether the word says Sydney Opera. Here it's not several neurons, but it's the same neuron over several repetitions. So in total, this image was shown six times. This image was shown this six times. Now, if you show a different image, then these neurons do not respond as strongly. Note that the, stim that the stimulus, the information is go only given at the beginning and the activity continues after the stimulus has been removed. So this is an indication, potentially, of Hepian assembly in the human brain. People have also looked at animal experiments with monkeys recorded in the monkey brain. Now, a monkey, you cannot simply ask, what do you see right now? But what you can do is, you can involve the monkey in a task. For example, you can present the first stimulus, and then one second later, or two seconds later, or five seconds later, a second stimulus is shown. And if it's the same stimulus, the monkey presses the right button and gets orange, orange juice, and if the stimulus is not the same, it has to press the left button in order to get the orange juice. Now, in order to solve this task, the brain has to memorize the activity for the delay period where no stimulus is given. And this is what the neurons are doing during the delay period. When the stimulus is shown, then some neurons show increased activity and this increased activity remains during the whole delay period until the final stimulus is shown and the monkey receives the orange juice or some other reward. Now, this looks like a very convincing curve. It's in primate temporal cortex. People did similar experiments in other areas, for example, in the prefrontal cortex. And you see sort of the same kind of pattern. However, it's not the kind of thing you would expect from attractor networks. It's not sitting at a stable value. It's, in fact, going up and down quite a bit. So, we don't claim that this is a sign of attractor networks. However, it's very close. It's not too bad. So, somehow, memory is kept in the brain, and this is indicated by increased activity. Simulations as well as the theoretic analysis shows that the concept of attractor memory can be translated into rather realistic networks. Realistic networks here means we can change the mean activity of patterns to make it more plausible, very low activity, only a small fraction of neurons is active at the same time. We can go from symmetric connections to asymmetric connections. That's not a problem. We can use a better neuron model for example, integrated fire model, but we could also use a Hodgkin-Huxley neuron model. We can separate excitation and inhibition in different types of neuron. We can work with a low probability of connections. So, there's a big way towards biology that has been taken. Nevertheless, abstractor memory models remain a rather abstract concept. They have been very influential. They are general, 
They can be adapted in different forms. But we don't claim that neural data uniquely says this has to be an attractor memory for memory, mo uh, uh, for memory me retrieval. But it's not too bad. It's pretty close. So many researchers have contributed to this field of attractor memory networks. I would say right after John Hopfield published his first paper on attractor memory neural models in 1982, quite a few theoreticians took up this topic and tried to extend it towards biology along the lines I just sketched today. As usual, you find uh, documentation online under neuraldynamics.epfl.ch.